to okay. my pleasure. Our good, office. Nice to be back in Valencia. It's really a pleasure having you and uh, having nice. an interview for our course on materials characterization yeah. at okay. UPB. So, first question, very quickly. The discovery of C60, later baptized as you by you as Bucky Bolt, is based on your work on molecular spectroscopy. How do you think that material characterization techniques should be considered for the new materials science education? I think it's uh, important to realize that uh, the standard uh, uh, sciences, chemistry, physics, uh, engineering, um, biology uh, of a hundred years ago, those were the, the subjects, really the boundaries have broadened and now one could say that uh, condensed matter physics, uh, synthetic chemistry, um, molecular biology, materials engineering are now almost one subject mm -hmm. in the sense that you can say m m modern materials could be, will require an understanding of almost all these subjects. And that means that we need to th rethink our education and certainly when it comes to research in materials you will need a cross-disciplinary approach and have people who have an understanding of condensed matter physics. You'll need uh, people who really are chemists who really understand the interaction of atoms, uh, hydrogen uh, interactions, uh, weak interactions, van der Waals forces, who understand the electronic properties of molecules, spectroscopy, because that's going to be interesting and important for molecular electronics. Uh, molecular biology, assembly, bottom-up assembly, and we, for instance, the brain is a very complex, maybe a computer type object, but it's been built by bottom-up assembly. Uh, engineering, materials engineers, are, are really people who need to make it happen, the technology, and to assemble these devices into useful um, uh, sort of major uh, computers and stuff like that. So modern science is incredibly exciting but very broad and I think we need to recognize that. I think we still have to be specialists in one or other area because it's such a hard thing to do. But we need to work together with people and really they have to trust the expertise of, of other people. And I, I think this is a problem because the universities are rather locked into these traditional departments, I mean physically in the buildings. I mean there are materials, science and engineering, but now the new term nanotechnology, I like to call it nanoscience and nanotechnology, N and N, because the science, the nanoscience is the fundamental part of it, the nanotechnology is the application of it. And I like to marry these two together because that's the way it is. But it's not really new, I mean it's, there are many different definitions, one could be um, atom by atom, molecule by molecule, assembly of a complex system. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. I and mean, if we think about the modern technology of the computer, it's top down. We create a piece of silicon and we make it and then we cut it up into smaller and smaller pieces. The question is, can you make a computer by bottom up assembly? Well, this has been created by protein by protein assembly on the basis of a d DNA blueprint. So we know it can be done. The challenge is, can we? do this. Well, it, maybe one day we shall. It's a long way off. And if you recognize this, then you say, okay, we need to learn something from biology about uh, assembly of complex systems. We le need to learn something from about biology in the, which, in the way that our body, all these test tubes of chemi chemicals, uh, work together. To understand what's in the test tube, we need the chemistry. Mm -hmm. to understand the interactions on a very small scale when we're talking about molecules. We need to have a chemist's understanding of the interaction and then we need the physicist's understanding of the intricate details of the condensed matter behavior. So it's a very exciting time but one very challenging uh, because one person I think cannot I know everything um, and so we work now in teams and okay. we must bring all those teams together really under one roof. I think if they're still separated in the 20 years time into chemistry, physics and biology and engineering, I think we're going to have problems. Okay. 
Quite a different question. And now, uh, new scientific equipment inc incorporate fancy computer support for a quick analysis of results and having numbers and figures. Sometimes these automated procedures lack rigor and prevent the observation of some evidences that could lead to new findings, just as the initial evidence of uh, C60 in molecular spectroscopy. So, in your opinion, is the computer support producing ready-made science that is relevant, less relevant than before? No, I, I don't think it's less relevant. I think it, it mustn't take, a, um, take over from experiment. I think the importance of the computer in my lifetime is that it now can help us to understand what's going on. When I first started as a, as a spectroscopist, molecular spectroscopy, um, you would uh, make a measurement of a structure of a molecule, or the electronic behavior, the, um, and you would see um, electronic structure in the electronic spectrum, the yeah. visible spectrum, and you wouldn't really be able to tell what was going on. You would guess, and your, um, your feel for where the energy levels would lie would depend on the molecule. I mean, there are many aspects, but that was one of them. And uh, I started in what's called microwave spectroscopy, which studied the rotations of these molecules, and we obtained very accurate structure. When I started, the theoretical quantum chemistry of uh, calculating structures was in its infancy and was not very good. But with computers, we gradually a able to uh, crunch out these extremely complex uh, mathematical formula involving derivatives, um, involving uh, functions over the position of an electron that was moving. And so we're getting better. And so I, u I use uh, the computer as a, a powerful tool to understand the experiment. And I think that is getting better. Um, there may be areas where the uh, the theory comes first, but it's pretty rare, very rare. I mean, um, by and large, theoretical uh, calculations tend to confirm follow. Uh, follow. follow in, in particle physics, may be slightly different, okay. where they're doing theory uh, to find out what sort of experiment they should be doing. Mm -hmm. But I think in chemistry, um, it's a, it's different, I think, by and large. You you do an experiment, and you that experiment is you understand it by um, using modern calculations. Okay. Um, but I, they 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 conflate very nicely. I think one shouldn't assume that the computer is taking over because it, uh, at the end of the day, it has to fit with observation. Uh, quite a different question again. If you have to choose three different uh, competencies or characteristics that should be encouraged and very well developed in a science, scientist, which ones would you choose? Well, the first one is not to aim at prizes. <laughs> I think it's very important to... Well, I can, one can only take one's own experience. There may be scientists who are very clever at school and clever at university and are aiming to win, win prizes. Um, but I wasn't one of those people. Um, I actually uh, was interested, in some ways more interested in graphic art and design. I, I won my first awards, not for science, but for my art and graphics. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I was good at science and uh, my father insisted that I, my science homework and maths homework came first. He was a refugee and felt that it, the, the most, um, the best education to get a job, which is what he want, was in the sciences, and I think that was correct. On the other hand, today I think it's possible I would be in graphic art, because when I was uh, 20, there, were no, there weren't so many avenues into um, media type jobs and things of this nature. Although I was offered a job with the BBC in education, uh, but I decided I was going to do a postdoc. And so I, at university, I wanted to stay at university because I was having such a good time. 
Um, I was playing tennis for the university. I was doing art and graph. Yeah, university. we got to, we got to the finals a couple of times. Um, we lot we 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 lost in the finals because of me because I I was not I didn't have the temperament that Nadal the great the in sport are very important that you have um, something special. I mean Djokovic yesterday. Uh, went through four match points I don't know so the the great tennis player has something else which I don't have I'm not I I under pressure I don't perform as well so I've always avoided pressure I always make sure that I get my work done the day before not at the last minute uh, but I always but anyway to cut a long story short um, I don't say you should do something that you enjoy I mean you might enjoy it but I don't enjoy hard work any more than anything else I say I do things where um, I do something and I do it to the best of my ability, um, not to satisfy the teacher. I'm not in. I'm, I to satisfy me. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. At school, you you hand in, you get marks, higher marks, and this more. But in fact, um, the most, the first, and most important thing is that you you do something and you do it to the best of your ability and you are not satisfied with a second-rate effort. That's the first thing. Uh, I don't think about whether the science I do is important. I only do what I find is interesting and puzzles me. I don't think this is an important area I'm going to go into. I've never done that. I've, uh, in fact, if, it is, if I think it's an important area, a hundred other people know it's an important area and the competition is quite high and the yeah. probability of making a breakthrough is quite small. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do know where there are important areas. We know solar energy conversion, um, but it's difficult. There are a lot of people working on it. But I don't work, go that way. I go another way, which is, gee, this is interesting, what's going on? And then I find I'm working on something, and it's 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I've not even thought about lunch. It's not that I... Yes, I you, they say you should do work. something you enjoy. Well, yes, someone enjoys, someone enjoys it when it's over, when the hard work is over, and you've got to discover something, maybe. Uh, but many times you just give, discover nothing. So, number one, do something which is a subject that doesn't bore you, hopefully excites you, find interesting, enjoyment, hopefully, yes, but something that is so absorbing intellectually that you go on and it, it doesn't matter, you want to do it. This is in so interesting what's going on here and you forget all uh, an understanding of time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next thing is that uh, we got the Nobel Prize but when I, w before we made the discovery that led to, I was very satisfied with my science. I, I, I was a professor. I had um, done several nice things, particularly two very nice things. I was really felt I'd done some nice work. I didn't know I was going to do such nice work. I didn't have the confidence in my own ability, but I, 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 was, I was teaching. I liked yeah. teaching at a university. I was at a university and I could play tennis. Uh, I played still quite a lot of tennis. I, in, I liked doing research. Uh, it was hard work but gradually I got results and I thought, gee, I'm not bad at this, right? Uh, and then I was thinking, well, you know, I'm, I've got a nice research program, I can see it going on for a bit, bit longer. And I thought on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, um, I would um, do art and graphics, which is what I always really wanted to do. Um, and uh, we built a studio on the house, we added a studio on the house so that I could work in there. But then in 1985 we made this big discovery which was so interesting and exciting of the C60 molecule that um, I decided to spend five years trying to prove it was right. Um, I didn't well, we, at the time we were pretty sure it was right, that we, what, what we proposed, that it was a soccer ball structure, the C60 molecule. But we, didn't, we, had no, we had no real proof. And so I then went on and said, I'm going to spend five years proving that we were right. But I also felt something more important, that if we were wrong, I wanted to be the person 
to prove it wrong because uh, I felt that was a, an ethical situation, you know, thing to do. Not so common today. I don't want I don't want someone else to prove it wrong. I mean, I felt that was extremely important in my mind. Um, we were pretty sure at the start that we were right because we'd done these experiments and we were moved by this sort of incredible excitement that, wow, we discovered a molecule the same structure as a soccer ball. We'd never heard of it. We didn't know anyone had thought about it. It was seen to be original. But then we discovered one or two clever people or so were in Japan that actually thought of it 15 years beforehand. What was important about the discovery was not that the molecule existed, but that the molecule could form spontaneously. And that was an important thing because it, perhaps the most important, because it told us something that we didn't fully appreciate about nanotechnology and assembly, that such a beautiful symmetric molecule would self-assemble and that it was the most stable form of carbon when you only have 60 carbon atoms. So then I thought that that was important. So the, here are some other aspects. I think if you make a, an observation, you have a responsibility to prove it right or wrong yourself. Okay. Um, and But don't go after prizes. Uh, I mean, when we, it was proven correct in 1990, five years after our discovery, then one thought, well, maybe we started to get prizes for awards for it. And then, of course, one or two people said, you know, I think it's going to be get the Nobel Prize. And then you thought, well, it might get the Nobel Prize. But not before. Uh, I, um, the, the, the discovery is the important thing. The Nobel Prize is very, obviously very nice. It's not what you think it is. There are negative aspects of this prize, and the, the, I'm not convinced that they balance out at more than zero because uh, <laughs> there are now responsibilities. So um, I sometimes think that uh, I think I would be happier had we not made the discovery. I, I, I mean, if had we made the discovery and someone else got the prize, I wouldn't be that happy. But <laughs> I think in many ways, these are, this is not what I originally wanted to do. I wanted to spend a lot more time in a studio doing the art and graphics that I did. But this, the discovery in the Nobel Prize launched me into other areas of education and uh, positions of responsibility. I'm continually being asked to support this or support that because they think the Nobel Prize might help. I'm not so sure it does. But I do feel there are some responsibility because I think society um, is losing its awareness of humanity. Of its, well, maybe it never had enough, uh, but I just feel there are some very um, things that worry me, and I, I, I feel, what should I do? Well, what I should do is just do what I can, and that is to get involved with education. I can't solve everything. I can't solve the sustainability issues. They're very important. So I think, well, let's go into education, and hopefully one of the people that we uh, make enthusiastic about science actually solves that problem. I think each person now involved in society needs to think, not, this is a big problem, it's not my area, but I'm going to go into it. I think you should go into that where, place where you have expertise and do it to the best of your ability, and every, those people who are good at solar cells, they should do that. Um, I can see several other important areas, but I think you, the way to do science is to do what you th are puzzled and interested in and are prepared to really uh, spend hours and hours and, and years. hours. Um, not necessarily enjoyment, just, wow, I'm going to crack this problem. Okay. One very quick question. You've presented in your visit to our university the GeoSet initiative. Yes. Uh, we know a little bit about that, but we're interested in knowing how would you rate the chances that GeoSet is relevant for the future of science dissemination and uh, joining all people together in knowledge, let's well, say that way. Well, I'm already very happy with what it is. I mean, obviously it'd be fantastic if more universities, and I think more universities will actually join together. Um, the, for me, the greatest breakthrough in education was the printing press. I think the second great uh, breakthrough in education is, was Wikipedia. I, I think 
Who could have imagined that half a million people would join together altruistically to contribute their knowledge for nothing, all right? And also anonymously, all right? So they work on this and they, you see this. And in my field of spectroscopy, it's better than the textbooks. It really is. There are less mistakes. The people who have created this material are actually people who have expertise in the area. Very often the textbook writer only has expertise in a small, in a small area and doesn't know everything and so there are, there are limitations. Now what we're doing is I think going to the next stage of Wikipedia. I think Geoset is, I call it uh, Wiki 2.0 mm -hmm. where we now see the person who created the material. I like subjectivity. I like to see the teacher. I think we, it'll be a long time before personal communications. Uh, I hope it never happens, that I want us to communicate as people. And that's what we're doing here. And that's why he, you here in Valencia have developed this great software which allows the uh, teacher to present the material that they have created. And um, it's so flexible that anyone really can use it and talk about whatever they want, all right? Uh, so it's not just for teachers. I think it's very good for students. And particularly, so I find that students, um, they come with a tremendous imagination. And it becomes a catalyst of creative uh, ideas. But it has lots of other things going for it in the sense that now because it's subjective and that as you see the students, they, they can use this in their resumes and they can get scholarships and jobs this way. And we're finding it extremely effective, Be especially if a, a student wants, say, a postdoctoral fellowship in another country. Mm -hmm. So what happens, I get every week two or three requests for, uh, to do a postdoc or to do, be a student yep. um, from India, from, from China, India. from India, uh, from all, all the time. From I, India and China, I would say 90% are from India and China. And uh, the question is, well, I can read this through. Now, I have to do a lot of work reading this. You know, you, you take a, a pile of paper like this, and I have to now sit down in the evening when I tired or whatever and I have to read this through. I may have to read 10, 20 of these things through. What we have done is we've eliminated that hard work and made it much easier for the student to uh, communicate what they think, who they are, whether they can teach or not, okay, what interests them, what they have done and what they would like to do. All right. So when I now a student comes for a reference for a job or a postdoc, I say, okay, but you have to do a presentation on the Geoset site. I'm not going to do it otherwise. And so they, I say, I want to do three, four, five minutes on the research project that you've done. But if you want a postdoc into this group, which one? Someone, UCLA or whatever. Uh, okay, which group? This one go and look at what they're doing and suggest a little project that might interest this person. And in fact, that's how I got my job at Bell Labs. I, I actually, when I was a postdoc in Canada for two years, I was interested in working with a group at, uh, at Bell Labs, uh, which was a major, the top physics labs in the world at the time. And I pro made a proposal of a research project that I was interested in. And they were not particularly interested in that project, but they were interested in me because of the sort of things that I was proposing yeah. was something that I had expertise that they were interested in. And so I, I went there um, and then went back to the UK. So here is a, a, a tremendous vehicle for, for students to get jobs and uh, it's working. And in fact, I think within two to five years, it's going to be inevitable. 
I think that within five years there's going to be on Geoset type website, whether they're ours or not, I don't know, if it's, if it, so. if it, it, it will be something similar. So each university will have presentations by their students, but they also have a record of their students. Yeah. They can use these uh, in assessment. It makes assessment a, a pleasure, because assessment is not in general a pleasure, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is uh, what we call a no-brainer, really. Okay, thanks, Harriet. Really, this has been wonderful having you here, having the opportunity of asking you these questions that I hope will have our students. No, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's, it's my job as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>